Hi, and welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSpool.com. So, uh, as promised in my previous video, nine books about tarot, which you can go back in my playlist and find to look at if you haven't seen that yet, uh, I'm going to start by talking in some detail about my first three books, uh, the first of which is, of course, Homo Ludens, and the other two are two very well-known books, uh, The Castle of Cross Destinies and Invisible Cities by Talat Calvino. Uh, so I'm going to talk for a moment about uh, each of these three books and try not to take up too long a time, and then I'm going to put in my usual wonderful picture-in-picture -picture feature, and then you can go ahead and see what kind of what we're talking about. Uh, and I'll splice the whole thing together, and it'll be a fabulous video. So the first thing I want to do is I want to apologize for the delay. I had really hoped to have this video up before the holidays, before uh, January 1st, but of course, you know, holidays caught up with me, and then they began some kind of horrible construction near my house, tearing at the street, doing this deep digging with this sort of enormous rotor tool, so it's kind of this rah, 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 journey to the center of the earth, sort of chewing noise that was going on. It was really most unpleasant and made it hard to film a video, but luckily today they stopped, so here we are. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for your patience and support. I've gotten a lot of really uh, great continued comments on all my videos for Kipper and Tarot, and I just really want to uh, thank you all for that and extend my gratitude to you. Uh, so let's go ahead now and get started and talk about uh, Homo Ludens. Uh, so uh, the author of Homo Ludens is a very famous uh, Dutch cultural historian. Uh, this book was written in the 1930s. His name again was Johannes Wiesinga. Now um, this book for some people, is a little difficult to read nowadays because of the time it was written in. Um, you know, he began as an Indologist. Uh, he studied Sanskrit. He became a professor of culture and of civilization overall. And he liked to find what was universally human in all civilizations and talk about that. Now, of course, today we are not so much into the universally universalizing type aspect. When it comes to talking uh, about culture, we're very hesitant uh, because that has in the past proven to have some really negative effects and negative interpretations towards um, minority people, uh, towards people of color, and uh, has sort of a uh, negative impact on the concept of multiculturalism and diversity. Uh, so, you know, some of the terms that he uses that are more universal offend some people nowadays, although many people will not find them remarkable. Uh, and sometimes he does use uh, words and concepts that seem questionable to us nowadays, such as archaic man or primitive man. Um, of course, we wouldn't use these kinds of terms anymore. Uh, but, you know, in the 1930s, that was, you know, how people talked. And um, if you're wondering about the kind of person that he was and what he meant when he used those terms, I would like to uh, assure you that he really did not mean um, any harm. Uh, and I think that can be shown by the fact that he ardently resisted the Nazis during the Second World War. In fact, he was such an opponent um, of the Nazis that he was actually imprisoned by them and died in captivity due to their horrible treatment of him. He died tragically just a few weeks uh, before liberation, before the end of the war. Uh, so, you know, if you, there are any questions that you have about his uni universalizing or, you know, cultural imperialism, I think that his resistance to the imperatives of the Nazis, he refused to teach what they told him to teach, he refused to revise his ideas about culture and civilization in line with the horrible, horrible Nazi ideology, shows that he was not, in fact, a racist and uh, that he had the highest ideals uh, for human understanding. So I just want to kind of put that stuff um, to rest right away. Now let's talk about uh, Homo Ludens itself and why his concept of play is so interesting to those of us who use Tarot and, you know, the variety of ways that it's used now. So the first thing I want to do is, is he talks very deeply about how play not only creates but extends human freedom. This is such an interesting idea and it's one that uh, we don't really hear too much of nowadays. Even though nowadays we're surrounded by computer games, we understand that play is a big industry, right? We don't, we really don't have this idea that everybody needs to play and uh, that it is through play that we make ourselves uh, and our civilization. 
And that's really great, right? Uh, that's just a really wonderful idea with a lot of possibility when it comes to using tarot. So, you know, he goes through and he talks about the different kinds of play that exist in a lot of different cultures with which he was familiar, right? So because he was such a scholar and had studied so widely, not only the East, but the West, Right? He talks a lot about what the, the idea of play means in different cultures. He talks about the Greeks, of course he talks about uh, the ancient uh, Indian and South Asian cultures because he was such a scholar, scholar of Sanskrit. He talks about what play meant to the Chinese. He even includes the Blackfoot Indians of North America, the Japanese. He talks about uh, in uh, you know both Arabic and Hebrew, and he discusses Latin. Uh, and, uh, Ultimately, he kind of settles on the Latin term uh, ludus, which covers sort of all kinds of play, and that's where we get the, the term now, ludics. And you often will read uh, formal studies of games, scholarly studies of games, in which people will talk about ludics and ludology. And this is uh, rooted in his adoption of the term, the Latin term ludus. Uh, so he wants, again, to uh, start from the beginning and say that, you know, play is not uh, functional. Uh, now, what does he mean by that, right? It's If you work in the human development field or in the child development field, you can often read books that talk about the kinds of play that children should be doing at a certain stage of their development. That is, play is seen as you know, functional, right? I know that you are at a certain stage of your human development if you sit up and you stack blocks, right? He, he wants to reverse that. He wants to say that because you're stacking blocks, the development happens, right? He doesn't think that, he, he doesn't think that, you know, play is a function of development, right? He would like to see that culture and play are two wellsprings of humanity that come from humanity's essential freedom. Now, knowing what he, uh, where he's coming from, right, in terms of the Nazis in the 1930s, you can see why this is important to him, right? Why his emphasis on human freedom, right, is really, really has a lot of meaning for him uh, against his historical experience, right? So that's just, you know, useful to keep in, to keep in mind. So after that, he talks a lot about how civilization comes out of culture. So we have these two wellsprings of human freedom, culture, and play. Play develops our human freedom and it moves culture forward and out of human freedom and culture emerges civilization. He does use this term uh, Western civilization which is again not something we we use a lot anymore but in the 1930s really you know that was how people talked and so again I, I don't want you know this our modern understanding to cause us to throw the baby out with the bathwater here when it comes to homo ludens. So, um, he talks uh, a lot about how culture comes out of play um, and how culture is played from the beginning, right? This is really great when we talk about Tarot and many other human actions, right? Because it means that we do have this, this continuing freedom. We can change our culture. We can change our actions. It's all a form of play. And then as we continue to explore through play, right, we can evolve and create even more freedom, right? Uh, he says something really beautiful here, that social life is endowed with supra-biological forms. Think about that, supra-biological forms, that which is above our biology, right? By which uh, he's talking about the human, the, you know, humanity itself, or you might want to say if, if, you know, you use these kinds of expressions, if you lean this way uh, towards the human spirit, uh, in the shape of play, which enhances its innate value, right? So we decorate our being and um, our humanity through play and extend our freedom. Um, so play is primary, right? But it's not that play becomes culture, right? They have a twin union, right? They're equal, right? But it's that play is first, not culture is first. And again, that's kind of the reverse of the way we often think about it, right? We have a culture in which we play games and different cultures have different games, but he wants again to reverse that. And that's just a very interesting aspect for those of us who are thinking about how to use Tarot, right? Which begins as a game 
and uh, then we continue to play other kinds of games with it and also to use it as a mirror. But again, this mirroring function is also a form of the, the, the essential human play. And because it's a form of play, this, he would argue, is how we extend and create freedom. Right? So uh, he talks about how play takes uh, place not only in you know physical games, games of activity, right, and intellectual games, soccer, backgammon, you know that kind of thing, chess, um, all of these these kind of two forms of games. He wants to talk also about uh, cultural games, right, that we that we play. One of them he considers to be law, right. He considers the lawsuit as a form of play in which it combines the game of chance, uh, the physical contest. Right, and also the the war of wits or the verbal battle, right? So he's he's very interested in looking at at the lawsuit or the concept of legality, the rule of law, as a combination of other forms of play, right? It's like 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 a soccer in the courtroom and and chess and making puns and telling riddles all at the same time, right? And somehow that we. Uh, did, sort of mesh these things up and then use them to create the boundaries uh, and the most uh, sort of sacred uh, parts of our society and civilization, he finds to be extremely interesting, right? When we talk all the time very reverentially about the rule of law and the constitution and how important these things are to us, he'd like you to know that, that all of these things are games, our rules of games are enforced and enacted through various play forms. So that's very interesting. Again, when we apply the same concept to what we do, we read Tarot for ourselves and others. He also uses war as another concept of play, right? Uh, as a negative play. And again, because of the time, and remember in his sort of, you know, pre-Nazi and Nazi era, he could see all of this arising from the First World War to the interwar period, then on to the Second World War, right? Uh, where he talks about, uh, you know, uh, how one wages war to create, and, and this is a very interesting term he uses, holy validity, right? So you often will meet people who have, you know, who are Wiccans or who have certain spiritual beliefs about the Tarot in which uh, playing various language games in Tarot with the cards also creates a kind of holy validity. And I, so I just wanted to sort of point that out. Um, and then he also talked about how uh, the second aspect of war as play is justice arises as almost as a mode of divination or a legal proceeding, right? So think about that, right? This is why people who say, you know, is God on your side? You know, how do you know that the angels are with you? It's, you know, do you win this battle? You pray to win the war. All of these kinds of, um, of ideas, right, that link uh, some very deep notions of how people conduct themselves and how they construct a social order through uh, very aggressive forms of physical and cultural play. So that's just a, another uh, an interesting idea. And then uh, he kind of throws this sort of left-handed idea sort of into the mix. He doesn't spend a lot of time on it, but I know that a lot of the people who follow topics such as my channel will be very interested in it. He says, war itself could possibly be regarded as a means of divination to find out who the gods have favored in contests of strength and strategy. So um, I'm not going to go too deeply into that. As I said, I don't want to keep uh, this video, you know, I want to keep this video sort of within bounds, but I just would like to kind of sort of put that out. Then he also talks about playing and knowing, right? How we create knowledge through play, uh, not only practical knowledge, Right when a, a great way that children learn about the world, and, you know, about basic physics is say, for example, by kicking a ball, playing soccer, playing baseball, catching, throwing. Right, we we intuitively learn the basic laws of the physical laws of the world, but we also learn other kinds of laws by playing these cultural games. Right, we. Uh, he discusses religion in this context as well. Esoteric and wonder-working wisdom is what he called, because these games that we play uh, reveal what seem to us to be rules about the cosmic order, right? And this goes back to his background in Indology as a, as a student of Indian culture and Indian philosophy, the uh, Indian idea of Leela, of divine play, the freedom of the divinity. 
Um, I think all of you who have been to yoga or have taken a yoga philosophy class have probably heard of this word and are familiar with this concept. But he argues uh, that, in fact, um, the Leela is not outside of us in any way, but it is within us and it arises from us, right? He is a historian. He is a rational person. Um, so he does uh, look at... Uh, at us in this idea, but he does have a very elevated idea of what human beings can be and of the destiny of mankind overall. So um, this is, you know, he's a, kind of an optimist, even though he lives and has lived through, obviously, very dark times in Europe. So that's really fascinating. Then he goes ahead and he talks about play and poetry, right? This is also a really important uh, for my friends who are also fans of Enrique Enrique, who you know does so much with tarot and poetry. Um, he talks about poetry using the Greek term poesis, and he says, I want to read this to you because this is so fabulous and is so important to all the language games that we play when we use tarot. Uh, poesis is in fact a play function. It proceeds within the playground of the mind, in language, in a world of its own, which the mind creates for it. There are things, their things have a different look from the one they wear in ordinary life and are bound by ties other than those of logic and causality. And then he goes on and he talks about puns, right? So he's not like saying embrace the, ir the irrational wholly, right? He's saying the irrational exists, right? And um, then he talks about how, you know, we have categories and boundaries both in, you know, in logic and rationality that are created and enforced by language. And then, you know, we use puns to escape those, right? Uh, this is something that, again, to refer back to Enrique, Enrique, that he does a lot when he talks about cards, uh, is he will use puns or anagrams, you know, uh, almost what many people would call concrete poetry, uh, poésie concrète, made famous by the French and also by the Brazilians, um, you know, to talk about how we can create categories, create this poetics of imaginary solutions, and then burst beyond them through uh, expanding uh, our language through puns and anagrams and other kinds of rearrangement. And this is how, you know, we can uh, use Tarot to, uh, to open ourselves up and become more free, escape our ruts, and move on into the kind of positive, optimistic, life-affirming solutions that we look for when we talk uh, about uh, modern Tarot. So that's just really great. Um, he does have a, sort of a, a Dionysian view of poetry uh, that comes again from his cultural background, right, as a scholar of, cl of various classicisms, both Western and Eastern, right, where he definitely sees that there is sort of a, a raving person, right, someone who has the wine of Dionysus and then goes out and creates poetry and does other raving, mad, quote-unquote, mad things, right? Um, so, you know, these are just ideas that are really useful and liberating in terms of uh, thinking about cards and what you can do with them. So I highly recommend Homo Ludens. As I said, I think that everyone who reads it will find it very mind-opening, very expanding in its focus on play and what play does for all human people, not only children but adults, and why it's absolutely necessary through all stages of our lives as human people if we wish to not only mature on an individual level but also move the entire uh, civilization and culture forward. So uh, again, I highly recommend this book and um, I'm interested to hear your feedback after you read it. So please don't hesitate to rush out, read to Homo Ludens. It's not a very long book. It's written in very simple uh, English. Uh, there are several good translations of it. And please go ahead and make your comments to me or ask me questions about it on social media. Thanks so much. Now I'm going to move on to the two books by Talo Calvino. Hi, okay, so now let's go ahead in the second portion of this video and let's talk about the two books by Italo Calvino. Specifically, I'm going to take them one by one and I'd like to start first with his Invisible Cities. Uh, you know, um, Invisible Cities, I think, nowadays is seen to be his best book and his most important book, although perhaps in the 80s and 90s people might have plumped for Calvino's other book, uh, you know, uh, If a Winter's Night a Traveler. But, um, 
Uh, nowadays, I, I, I'm feeling we're all pretty much settled on the importance of invisible cities. Uh, an opera was recently made about it, as I mentioned in the um, original video, which is fascinating as a flash mob headphone opera in the Los Angeles train station. And that was uh, really incredible. And if anything, that speaks the continuing importance of Italo Calvino's work to um, artists of all stripes, not just people who have an interest in cards. So let's talk for a moment about what happens in Invisible Cities. This is a very, very short book. It has almost only um, a, one paragraph on each page, and, and I don't think it's more uh, than, you know, a, a few, a hundred and few pages long. I don't even think it's, it's 200 pages long. It's a very interesting book. So the premise of this book is that the great Italian explorer, Marco Polo, who comes from Venice, meets Kublai Khan and wants to speak to him about all the things that he has seen, all the cities that he sees. Uh, all the places that he's been as a great traveler, right? The problem is, of course, that he and Kublai Khan have no language in common. <laughs> so they sort of speak by hand gestures and grunts and sort of teaching each other, you know, different words. And, um, uh, you know, each page or paragraph goes on to describe a different city, quote unquote, right, that Marco Polo has seen as he attempts to communicate his experience and the experience of mankind outside of Kublai Khan's own experience to him so that he can learn from them and gain benefit of them. Of course, when you can, when you think about this, the analogy of this to cards, particularly the tarot, is immediate, right? Uh, each card is its own quote-unquote invisible city. Each one can be seen as having something to tell you that's outside of your experience. It may be in a language or a symbolic language that you don't understand and which at first you have nothing in common with and you really need to sort of work through various signs and grunts, right? Learning the language, teaching it your language, right? Learning, you yourself learn its symbolic language, right? And then we sort of, you know, sort of get somewhere and we have some sort of profound insight, but at the end, we're still dealing with something that is foreign and remote to us, but somehow also yet enriching some, something that's really, in a certain sense, invisible and fictional, but yet changes us profoundly that has positive and concrete effect. And this is what happens to uh, Kublai Khan as he goes through the invisible cities or is led through the invisible cities, which is almost kind of a quote-unquote mind palace. Um, you know, uh, by Marco Polo. Uh, now there are many, uh, many, many passages in this book that are directly relevant to several contemporary uses of cards. Um, and I would just like to read uh, one of them, uh, and which I think, you know, is so useful to people who read cards for themselves and others. When many people come to me, I, uh, I, I usually begin, you know, if they're not used to my reading method, by actually reading this passage to them so they can think about why what we're going to do with cards is much different than what other people do and why I think it has a different meaning. And again, this also refers back to the concept of Enrique Enrique's imaginary solutions. So let's go ahead and, and just read this passage. It's so beautiful. Uh, this was the target of all Kublai Khan's questions about the past and the future. For an hour, he had been toying with his target, like a cat with a mouse. And finally, he had Marco Polo with his back to the wall, attacking him, putting a knee on his chest, seizing him by the beard. This is what I wanted to hear from you. Confess what you are smuggling through time, moods, states of grace, and what elegies. So, um, you know, this is just a, this is just fantastic, right? Because this is what we are doing when we talk about cards with people, when we sit with them as equals and we partner with them to think about cards, is we are trying to smuggle or help them smuggle themselves through various moods, states of grace, and elegies, right? And how people manage to carry these things through time in language is um, of essential importance to understanding uh, human growth and um, to helping people uh, see themselves in a new light so they can make these kinds of positive changes that I'm always talking about. So let me continue with this, um, this passage, it's very short. These words and actions were perhaps only imagined as the two sit together silent and motionless 
watching the smoke rise slowly from their pipes. This cloud of understanding dissolved at times in a wisp of wind or remained suspended in midair, and the answer was in that cloud alone. Right? So there's something about being together face to face in some kind of relationship of language or of non language, of silence, right? Which is also a form of human communication, sitting together in silence, that is deeply transformative and that contains the answers uh, to what it is that we want to know, right? So the answer and the conversation, as I've said before, is in the relationship as people sit together and work together. And this is just. Uh, so beautiful, right? Of course, all of these cities that uh, Marco Polo is describing are mental aspects, emotional aspects, mood aspects of Venice, right? Because that's the city, the only city that he really knows from his own experience. And yet, from his experience using his play function to refer back to Homoludens, he can create all of these expanded possibilities which offer um, insight, value, and reflection uh, to Kubla Khan. And, uh, this is, again, if we think about this, if we really think about what this means as we read this book, we can see immediately how this can benefit us and our sitters and profoundly change the way that we use cards for the better. So um, that's, you know, what I want to say about Invisible Cities. Again, I highly recommend this book. It's the second most important book about cards. It's precisely for this concept of smuggling moods, states of grace, and elegies. Uh, so that said, I want to go ahead and uh, talk uh, about a much more familiar book that many more people in the tarot community have uh, heard about, and that is, of course, Italo Calvino's Castle of Cross Destinies. Hi, so now we're on to talking about Italo Calvino's Castle of Cross Destinies. You know, what's interesting uh, about uh, this book and um, why it's my third book uh, is the way that uh, Italo Calvino uh, talks about how meaning and interpretation is created. So it can be written, of course, by you know words from an author. It can be spoken as we author our um, language, but it can also be made by images, right? And this is something that uh, we're very much used to now because, of course, we're so used to manga to graphic novels. We have such a deep history with film and the meaning of film as an art form, which, you know, was less common when uh, Calvino uh, was writing this book uh, in the late 60s and in the early 70s, before we really uh, took sort of comics and visual rhetoric, uh, you know, very seriously. And to talk about film as an art form or cinema as an art form was something that was uh, rather rarefied and was not something that you know common people always acknowledged when it was still felt largely that movies were just a form of entertainment. Uh, so let's talk again for a moment about this book. So you know, Italo Calvino uh, came from a scientific family. He was born in Cuba. Both his parents were botanists, where they were studying exotic tropical botany, and then uh, he himself was interested in becoming an agronomist, studying agriculture. But luckily for us, <laughs> he gave that up after his experiences uh, as a partisan uh, during the Second World War. Again, he resisted fascism physically and put his life on the line to resist fascism. Um, and then uh, this led him to write a book about his wartime experiences, at which point he realized that he was really interested in uh, literature, in how to tell stories, how to make human experience conveyable, the strange quality of contemporary or modernist human experience, uh, how the horrors of the Second World War had changed humanity, had changed the meaning of culture, and had changed what was it was possible to do in language. So uh, he moved uh, to Paris after he had written some very beautiful, uh, terse, and introspective short stories. He moved to Paris where he fell into a school um, of experimental writers, um, the famous Ulipo School. Uh, they had interests in games, in mathematics, and in other experimental art forms, and they very much uh, used those interests in composing their modernist novels. So uh, he did that uh, as well. Uh, so the book of Castle Cross Destinies was actually written in two parts, um, and one is uh, sort of takes place in a tavern, and the other takes place in a castle. It uses two decks of cards: the Visconti deck and also the Tarot de Marseille. Uh, 
I would normally not go so much into this book because I think it's fairly well known within the tarot community, but I do realize that a lot of people who watch my channel are new to cards, and I definitely want to make sure that um, th this book in particular is accessible to everyone, so forgive me uh, if I take a, a little bit of time and kind of uh, delve into it. So the premise of this book is that we have a, a group who are traveling together almost on a pilgrimage, almost a Chaucerian type uh you know, sort of experience, and they go through a forest in which they are enchanted and they lose the ability to speak. They cannot speak to themselves and they cannot speak to other people. Now this, of course, is a, a psychological phenomenon. He's using this as a metaphor for the modern experience, and certainly uh, those of us who do tarot both for ourselves and other people uh, who use it as a mirror realize that it's there are, in fact, a lot of people who, who have become mute in this way, both to themselves and to other people who have been taught uh, to be this way and seemingly have lost their power of effective language. So um, he explores uh, this position, this contemporary position of modernity, through using the tarot cards and through this a story. It's what's very interesting about this book, and, and you really have to read it to see how this is so, um, is that depending on how you understand who the author is, how you understand the author, narrator, character, reader relationship, uh, the meaning of the story changes, right? It can be read sort of as a fairy tale, right? Or how fairy tales are constructed or how fairy tales come to be or how fairy tales come to have deep cultural meaning. Um, it, but then it can also uh, talk about self-reflection and self-understanding and how we construct ourselves in language to ourselves as well as what it means to watch other people do so. Right. So, you know, when people tell us stories or we construct stories for ourselves, right, we are, you know, doing all kinds of complicated things. But when we just watch, when we just watch, right, we are still participating. Like Milton says, they also serve who only stand and wait. Right. And the question is, what is our action and what is our relationship to language and to the person when we are listening or watching them do a construction? Right. When we are, quote unquote, the audience or the reader. Right. So that's a, you know, a, a very interesting idea. So what what he does in these books is is he tells uh, several very well known uh, tales uh, from King Arthur, like the, the story of Percival, the story of Lancelot, you know, other tales. He tells them by laying down the tarot cards. So these people who are in the situation in the tower in the castle, they can't talk. And instead, they have a deck of tarot cards and they lay them out so that people can then follow their stories through the tarot cards that they lay out. Now, this um, has been adopted, of course, uh, a lot in the tarot community and also in the writing community. You can go buy books by like by my friend Karine Kenner, you know, Tarot for Writers, who has a variety of games you can play with tarot cards in different methodologies that will allow you to construct stories, use them to outline your novel, use them to write poems, all of these things. You know, a lot of people do this. You can take a lot of workshops. Um, on this, of course, many famous poets have done this. I think particularly uh, the poet Anne Waldman and also the poet Alice Notley uh, are famous for doing this, and, and as well as Michael McClure, although he doesn't use tarot cards, he makes his own deck for the particular occasion using a strict sort of game mechanic with word lists that he generates in a sort of ritualized manner. Um, but you know, uh, you also see this happen in non-Tarot context. For those of you who have followed my friend Yuav Ben Dov, right? He sometimes will talk about the Israeli practice of Nord cards or of OH cards, right? I think the OH cards are now somewhat global, right? Where you get various decks of cards that don't have any esoteric or tarot content on them, but uh, indicate different actions and um, functions uh, or emotions and uh, therapists or counselors go ahead and, and work with people to choose and lay out situations and solutions uh, to help them articulate again what they're feeling various kinds of uh, possibility and then they use techniques like 12-step or motivational interviewing to go ahead and make those actionable so that people can um, 
be guided to find their own motivation, to make their own commitment to change in their own language according to uh, feelings and topics they have chosen, and then they own them so they can go forward and act them out and find their own power under their own power. Thus, they will live their own lives in their own authenticity and not just be doing what other people tell them or following the guidance of some expert, you know, who imposes various attitudes on them. So um, this is what you can see in action through uh, the Castle of Cross Destinies, and it's really given rise to a lot of very interesting tarot practices. So before I go on and talk in, uh, in two more videos about my other six books, even if you don't read any of the other you know, six books that I talk about in the future, I really, really urge you to read these three and devote some time to thinking about how you use cards and have these affect your deep underlying philosophy of what cards mean and how we can use cards in the contemporary world uh, to talk to ourselves and others. So uh, thanks so much until I get a chance to make my next video, which will probably be in the next few days, maybe moving on into next week. Um, you know, have a happy new year. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, enjoy your cards. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me on social media because I'm always very happy to talk about these books. As I said, they're, they're not uh, the common books that most people talk about when they talk about Tarot, but I really do think they're transformative and enlightening. So thanks so much and have a great day.